Right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And we have got Professor uh, Joe Neal with us as part of our um, October theme, which is based on neuroscience and psychology. And before I actually introduce her and we start our discussion, I would like to give you an idea about the format that we have. So as this is especially for those who might be new to Live with Scientists format. So we're going to start with a 30 minutes of 30 to 40 minutes of discussion with Jo where, where we will be um, having a informal chat. She will be telling us about her expertise. And after this, uh, we're going to have a 10 minute break. And after the break, we're going to um, resume together to actually start our question and answer session. So uh, if you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, please feel free to actually submit your questions as the discussion is going on and during the break and during the Q&A session. So um, after, during the Q&A session, I will be asking you all questions on your behalf. And if you feel the need to follow up any question, please feel free to submit your questions again. So we will be definitely um, taking note of those and keep asking the questions until uh, Joe says enough is enough. So, Joe, again, thanks very much for joining us today. It's absolute pleasure pleasure to have you here to talk about psychedelic medicines. And before I let you to uh, start, I will just briefly would like to introduce you. So, Joe is a professor in um, in uh, ph uh, psychopharmacology, and luckily she decided to move from University of Bradford to University of Manchester about seven, eight years ago. Um, she has actually done her pharmacology degree at University of Bath, and after that she actually moved to University of Birmingham to start her career in... Um, in um... Oh, I forgot. Psychedelics, yes, you started it in psychedelics, didn't you? Okay, lovely. So, yeah, so she has got over three decades of experience in this field and she has published several papers. I think it's about 70 or 80 by now. And Joe, again, thanks very much for joining us and this stage is yours. Would you like to actually start telling about yourself and why you're interested in psychedelic medicine? Thank you. 
Um, Joe, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We are getting some feedback from our audience that they cannot actually uh, hear you. I just want to uh, check again with the team to see if the problem has been resolved. I've been trying a couple of things. And if not... Yeah, let's try that. If you don't mind, please. That's, that's fine, it's technology. Um, uh, let me just see if what they're saying. Uh, well, I'm I'm in the same boat with you. Um, let's see. Um, I'm looking at here, and everything seems. Yeah. 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 third core goal so I think the combination of these and well an encounter with a combat veteran which I'm going to tell you about in a minute and um, starting to work with drug science being on their committee meeting lots of those guys and that lots of these sort of factors all came together to make me switch so I'm now focusing the rest of my career on psychedelic medicine so I am now working for Drug Science. So Drug Science is the UK's leading independent organisation providing um, evidence-based information about drugs. We have formed a medical psychedelics working group and I am honoured to be the chair of that group. We have four aims, education around psychedelics, um, destigmatization of psychedelics. For some reason, people think these drugs are incredibly dangerous, which is absolutely not true. I was giving a talk uh, about this to the neuroscientists at Manchester last year, and in the pub afterwards, one of the chaps, who's a, who's a very smart neuroscientist, said to me, how can you be um, you know, um, suggesting or supporting psychedelic medicine when these drugs are so dangerous? actually and I think that gives you a really good idea of the misunderstanding and the stigma around psychedelics and that we are certainly going to debunk the myths because actually these medicines are incredibly safe and when we think about the the paradigm the medical paradigm and the way in which they're taken um, we can really see how safe these medicines are and how infrequently they will need to be taken for healing so the other aims that we have then I guess the overall aim of our psychedelics working group is to enable patients to access the medicines they need, psychedelic medicines, in um, on the NHS, so to not have to pay. And of course, there has been a bit of a disaster around medical cannabis with the government legalising that in November 2018, sorry, but with, without people being able to access medical cannabis on prescription, which is where Drug Sciences Project 2021 comes in to enable patients to access it. Of course, NICE wouldn't approve it um, because uh, not a, they said there's not enough evidence for, you know, for its value, which of course we know is not true. All those children with um, treatment-resistant epilepsy and people with neuropathic pain that uh, cannabis works so well for. So this will be a real issue. There are, of course, several barriers to psychedelic medicine being available on the NHS. One, they're illegal, still illegal, and they're in schedule one of the misuse of drugs regulations, which makes them incredibly hard to research. And that's something else I will come on to in a minute. So that's drug science. I'm also, I mentioned combat veterans. I'm also working for a combat veterans charity called Heroic Hearts UK, mm -hmm. uh, which is a branch of Heroic Hearts in the States. And their aim is to enable um, combat veterans and first-line responders 
to uh, access ayahuasca therapy on retreat. And I mentioned the difference between a clinical and a retreat setting. And we don't really know yet, but this seems to, a retreat setting seems to work particularly well for combat veterans and we think also um, first responders. But, and I will tell you the story of the combat veteran I, I met in a minute and, and who really um, changed my, well, my direction of my career. Um, it's very expensive to go to Peru or Costa Rica or even the Netherlands to, to spend a week on an ayahuasca retreat. So uh, the Heroic Hearts will be fundraising and we will be also be doing observational studies like I was talking about Simon Russell is doing. So studying the effects of psychedelics in retreat settings in a sort of naturalistic setting as an observational study as opposed to a planned clinical trial. Um, and actually, I don't think the randomized control trial is, is really the, the right model for um, doing clinical research with psychedelic medicines. So I'm also working with the Conser Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, and that is led by Crispin Blunt, MP for Rygate, used to be the prisons minister. And he has uh, seen the horrors of drug um, addiction in prison and the lack of support for prisoners with substance abuse problems. And that led him to want to reform UK drug policy, and he has set up this um, conservative group. I should say that this is a cross-party parliamentary issue. There are many um, Labour, Green Party, Liberal and Conservative MPs who want to reform our drug laws. Of course, as you will probably all be very aware, our drug laws are, well, 50 years since the Misuse of Drugs Act, completely outdated. They are... they criminalise and punish people for having substance abuse disorder, the most vulnerable people um, in society and cause an awful lot of harms. So as part of his, um, his determination, he, he's a fantastic um, um, MP, as is Jeff Smith, local MP for Withington, who chair co-chairs that cross-parliamentary group on drug law reform. Um, so... Um, yeah, I think it's very important to understand that this is a cross-parliamentary issue. It's very important to reform the drug laws. But um, one of his aims then is to reschedule psilocybin. Now, psilocybin is the active constituent of magic mushrooms. Many of you will have heard of it, I hope. So I'm, I'm sure you'll have heard of many of the psychedelic molecules. So mm -hmm. LSD, Albert Hoffman very famously synthesized this in 1938. Sandals had a huge supply of... Um, of LSD and supplied it free of charge to many laboratories. And I see there was a lot of research conducted in the 60s and the 70s on LSD, showing the beneficial effects um, for particularly for the um, distress and anxiety and depression that occurs in a terminal diagnosis. So in living with cancer or, or in receiving a terminal diagnosis. And the effects of LSD were remarkable, extraordinary, seemed to allow people to sort of reevaluate their um, relationship with the world um, and with other people and to enable them to live the rest of their life um, in a really positive way and to sort of meet their death well. And, you know, we're all going to, to die. Um, so th and this is actually one of the, the most extraordinary um, beneficial effects of, of medical psychedelics, I think. But that research was stopped rather abruptly by the Nixon administration in the States. So in the US, a lot of this work um, had, was going on um, on, on um, the end of life care and also on pain. There were very, some very interesting studies of LSD as an analgesic, reducing pain, quite low dose, um, seems to have a very beneficial effect for pain. Actually, a, a study came out this year on low dose LSD, reducing the, um, or increasing the ability of healthy volunteers to keep their hand in a bucket of cold water. That was, um, so it sort of reduces the pain sensations. So uh, there's an awful lot about psychedelic medicine that actually, the, the research was started, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, 
some really nice results and then it was halted by the next administration and, and most likely because of um, well that altered state of consciousness that psychedelics produce enable you to um, one the sort of pro empathy pro social pro connection with nature with the universe and that really was not deemed helpful for for recruitment for fighting in the Vietnam War. But that, that you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly why not. Um, but uh, Nixon launched the war on drugs, which as we know has been an absolute disaster. So it's just interesting to think back a little bit about the history of psychedelics and why the research was stopped. And then they were put into schedule one of the Misuse of Drugs Act. But actually in probably the 2000s, a lot of the interest in the beneficial effects of, of medical psychedelics was reignited and in spite of the fact that they're class A drugs in Schedule 1, research started again, uh, which is very, very encouraging. So what we are, so the, the, the disorders that are treated so well by psychedelics are those very hard to treat conditions, really where nothing else works. So we're talking about treatment resistant depression. So these are people who you know, have tried everything, uh, have tried all the different um, antidepressant drugs, all the talking therapy, and really nothing works. So they're at the end of the line where, where you know, suicide becomes one of their, mm. of their options. Um, 25 years, maybe we're talking, these people have, have really suffered with depression. And if you're a psychiatrist, psychologist, you've very, very, very little to offer these people. So mm. the fact that psychedelic medicine um, can heal such people. Uh, I don't know if any of your, your viewers here have seen the Magic Medicine film, but people, if um, if you get a chance to see that, please, we're, we're hoping to bring that to Manchester, actually. We were going to bring it, of course, and then the, the virus struck. But we can, of course, um, screen it online. Fantastically, um, well, it's a very um, heart-rending documentary that shows the experiences of three chaps who've been living for a long time with treatment-resistant depression. And they enter David Nutt and Robin Carhart Harris's trial at Imperial College. And they take two doses of psilocybin. They take a low dose first, and then they, a week later they take a high dose. And this is psycho, psycho, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So they do an awful lot of preparation beforehand. This is what we call set and setting. So it's very important to be in the right mindset for psychedelic therapy. So an awful lot of work um, has to be done sort of to prepare you for the experience, which can be pretty traumatic. Uh, if you watch the film, you'll see some of these chaps crying and actually very scared about the sort of what the psychedelic reveals to them in the high dose session, accompanied by a psychotherapist with two psychotherapists in that trial. Um, the the difference really between psilocybin and LSD, they both um, work on the same serotonergic system. And you'll all have heard talk about the 5-HT2A receptor, I guess, um, located in, in the cortex, which is, is sort of how they start. That's their, their sort of preliminary interaction. Um, psilocybin has a shorter half-life, so the experience does not last so long. Um, and you'll have heard probably of DMT, mm -hmm. uh, dimethyltryptamine, which is the active ingredient of ayahuasca. That's even much shorter. That's a much shorter half-life, so the experience doesn't last um, nearly as long. They all have similar mechanism of action. Um, so that really to just explain then that after the, the, they have had the experience with the high dose, they come back a week later and they have what we call integration therapy. So that's trying to make sense of the psychedelic experience. Mm. Um, and really very important for, for the healing process to have that set so your mindset, so you're prepared for the psychedelic experience. Relatively high doses for psychiatric conditions. And then um, you have a lot of integration. So other, other disorders that, that um, are starting to show positive effects PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, experienced by survivors of trauma, so combat veterans, mm. that sort of combat stress, um, sexual trauma, 
um, childhood abuse. And actually, the, the chaps in the um, treatment of cis and depression trial all seem to have, well, two of them had quite significant childhood trauma. And the sort of conventional medicines like antidepressants don't really enable you to, they sort of damp down the system. They don't allow you to um, sort of experience and face your fears and to face the guilt and to realise that, that none of this was your fault. And that's really where the, the healing seems to come from, um, seems to be enabled. So some other disorders are addictions. I mean, if you're an alcohol alcoholic, there's very little, you know, you will probably, when you're in the state of withdrawal, get a benzodiazepine like Valium, and then you'll be offered antidepressants and attendance at Alcoholics Anonymous mm. or, or something similar. And really that doesn't treat many people with alcoholism, tobacco addiction. I never forget hearing a woman talking about her experience with um, I think it was psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms, and she was a very heavy smoker. And she said when she was um, taking the mushrooms, she could so kind of see the, the blackness in her lungs and the harm that the cigarettes were doing to her. So she was really able to feel the damage that that was doing to her physiology. And she gave up, so she only had one dose, and then she gave up smoking. She said her husband smoked still, and he would offer her a cigarette, and she couldn't bear to have one. I thought that was that, that's an amazing um, healing, mm. amazing experience. Yeah. So anxiety, uh, we talked about the end of end of life care. So I want to talk to you a little bit about PTSD and to tell you about um, a combat veteran I, I spoke with. A uh, friend of my daughter's, he'd been a paratrooper, a young chap, paratrooper, and really, the military was his career. So he left school at 16 and he decided that this was, you know, this was it for him and, and he was going to stay in the military. Got very disillusioned, went to Afghanistan, uh, experienced some, some bad situations and got disillusioned and um, left the military. And what I learned is that um, the sort of mechanism for coping with stress is alcohol. Mm. So the, the soldiers, because they kind of a zero drugs policy, soldiers are encouraged to use alcohol to cope with their stress. Well, this leaves many veterans who leave the military with a, a drink problem when they leave the military. Um, so, I mean, this did not happen to this particular chap, but uh, something I forgot to tell you is that as part of my sort of switching to, to understanding psychedelics better, I um, have commissioned at Manchester two studies, one on Schedule 1 restrictions to research. Uh, we interviewed researchers up and down the country about their difficulties with uh, research in psychedelics or, or cannabis or anything, that, any drugs that are in um, Schedule 1. So, of course, cannabis is now legal as a medicine, so the medicine, uh, the medical components, cannabis-based medical products are not in Schedule 1 anymore but lots of other canna cannabinoid molecules are still. Um, so that is a little bit of a problem. So, But the other study was interviewing combat veterans who had used psychedelics to heal their, um, their PTSD. And one chap uh, seemed to be that people maybe start with MDMA, so they start with ecstasy, and then they go on to use a psychedelic for the sort of full healing. And this chap had used MDMA and stopped drinking. So it had kind of cured his, well, mm. if you like, healed his his um, problem problematic drinking. Okay. And of uh, um, fascinating. And of course, Ben Sessa in Bristol has just completed an alcohol link trial or a trial in, in alcoholism with MDMA with very successful results. And it seems to enable people to to drink responsibly. So this um, and to not drink out of control. Mm. So this chap. Um, that we interviewed said he was able to go to the pub and have two pints and maybe not drink again for two or three months. That's which great, yeah. Is, is absolutely great because most models for alcoholism are abstinence. So, you know, you, you can't, and actually, a, a very good friend of mine has chosen to follow that path, um, recovering alcoholic. Anyway, so back to the veteran. I was absolutely fascinated by his story. So, he, a former para, and he had trained with the Greenberries in America. So he knew that 
you know, because they, of course, have the MAPS program where MDMA is a um, huge program of um, giving veterans access to MDMA to heal their trauma. So he um, knew, he eventually got diagnosed with PTSD, became very ill, not sleeping, very bad dreams, hypervigilance, so could not um, be out in public, you know, on buses or um, in crowded spaces. And I think his girlfriend had said to him, you know, you really have to do something about this. So he took himself to Holland, to Amsterdam, bought some truffles, sat in a hotel room with his girlfriend and did two reasonably high doses of psilocybin as an active ingredient in these truffles that are legal in, in the Netherlands, which is something else I can come on to um, the different countries' um, sort of strategy or, or mm. drugs, drug laws. And this is really not what we would recommend to be on your own, to not have a therapist with you, to not have... I mean, I think mindset, he had prepared himself very well for this, though he'd learned an awful lot about it. Anyway, long story short, he came out of that hotel room well. And that was almost two years ago, and he is still well, and he has not had another you know, new dose. He has not needed that. So the other thing... Well, so something about that that I thought was shameful, that... Somebody who fought for their country, what the military yeah. go, you know, fight to keep us safe, um, could not access the medicine he needed in yeah. his own country and, and could not access it on the NHS. Yeah. So he had to pay. I, he couldn't afford to go to Peru, you know, yeah. Or, yeah. or Costa Rica. So I think that's pretty shameful of the UK government not yeah. to support their their combat veterans. Yeah, so that, that sort of brings me to my question, though, you know, so do you think it, we're actually going to see a development like we've seen with um, hemp oil, you know, with cannabis, that it's actually going to be um, available, going to be available in NHS? And if so, do you think the research or the data that we have is already there or do we need more studies? I mean, there are several problems with the cannabis industry, aren't there, and, and with hemp oil and being able to buy CBD everywhere and there being absolutely no regulation of what is in it um, and very you know, very few trials. Actually, I saw a study about high-dose CBD being potentially um, harmful. So I, I, that you know, we, we really must avoid that happening with psychedelics. And... It's, it's very much, well, from, from my perspective, it's very much a medical model and that, um, you know, people will have, be treated in the right set and setting. So it will be, um, you know, available with psychotherapy. So we would call it psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And it depends who you talk to, whether the psychotherapy or the psychedelic medicine is the real healing component of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, my thoughts are you absolutely need both together. Um, this, of course, will be quite expensive on the NHS, but the, the, the sort of extraordinary thing is people like um, this chap I told you about, or in the Magic Medicine film, people only need one or two doses. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and maybe some people will need another dose in three months' time. But in terms of having it, so thinking about side effects, this is not a medicine you have to have every day. So mm. it's pretty much side effect free, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and physiologically very safe. But, at, at, you know, no drug is without risks. And at Drug Science, we are conducting some research into potential adverse effects. But these are much more likely to be psychological adverse mm. effects. Mm. Um, and maybe people taking a lot in the wrong circumstances without the right mindset. Um, but we, of course, we need to do more research. And something I should just talk about a little bit is the barriers to research. Okay. So there are three huge issues and, and something that I would like um, the audience to understand. Schedule one, a drug being in schedule one means that it technically it has no therapeutic medical benefit. And, and Psychedelics were put into Schedule 1 a long time ago, misuse of drugs regulations, and really it's time for a review. And with the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, we have submitted a, um, an application, um, a document, very, very detailed document, asking government to reschedule. 
and they have that at the moment they've had that for a little while um, and we hope they're giving it serious consideration so what does this mean in practice if a drug is in schedule one well it costs a lot of money because you have to apply to the home office for a controlled drugs license so for somebody like me who's an animal researcher it cost me over three thousand pounds to get the license and then of course you have very strict regulations about how you store that drug uh locked alarm cabinets and i shall we're lucky i'm in the school of pharmacy it's slightly easier for me but every building where the drug is held or for a clinical study where it is put into the capsules where the study is blinded um where the the patient receives the drug all of those need a, a separate controlled drugs license so for my good uh colleague john Ruck, uh, james rucker at king's doing the psilocybin depression trial he had to have six separate controlled drugs licenses so that was over twenty thousand pounds out of his research budget because the UK universities won't pay for this. So that's a huge barrier. So our research revealed that smaller universities, people will not consider doing this kind of research because of the huge costs. There's a massive delay. It took me a year to get my, uh, my license. Six months seems to be the average. The form is incredibly difficult to fill in. Whoever holds the license has to have a DBS check. And you know, we're scientists. We're usually quite responsible, sensible people. So it's enormously difficult to get a controlled drugs license. So the Home Office stance is that you can do this research because you can apply for, for a license. But actually, just to be very clear that um, it, it really hinders research, the current status, scheduling status of psychedelics. And we're asking them to reschedule psilocybin because compass pathways are making psilocybin in the laboratory. In fact, Albert Hoffman did this in the 60s. Um, so it's it's easily available. They have um, supplied me with psilocybin for a small animal study that we're doing. Um, something else is that we have no such restraints or um, extra permission required to do research with a schedule two drug mm. and these are potentially much more harmful cocaine amphetamine heroin ketamine pcp fencyclidine angel dust that i use so really there's quite a lot of confusion uh, amongst academics about whether why it's in schedule one and whether it is you know because it doesn't kind of make sense so we did find quite a lot of confusion in our study as well anyway just that's that's a sort of an aspect that's um I feel particularly strongly about it because it's hindered um, some research that I'm trying to do. Um, so I'm not sure that there's anything else I need to tell you <laughs> just at this moment. Um, I guess you're probably interested how these drugs work in the brain. Exactly, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am, as I said, I have no David Nutt. I really suggest that you... Um, you log into one of his lectures. He's always giving lectures up and down the country. I mean, it was his idea to look at um, depression. I don't think that had been done before because of what was revealed from the brain imaging, the brain scans of people in the psilocybin depression trial. Now, we know that these drugs are agonists at the 5-HT2A receptor, which is located in the cortex. Um, we know that the, the, the brain is composed of sort of, uh, circuits and that these are kind of discrete circuits that, that communicate with each other but um, are quite well sort of controlled. But what, what psychedelics seem to do through this interaction with the 2A receptor is reconfigure mm. the brain um, and, and really even from, from one single dose. And I, I think this is why... People describe the experience as um, profound. Most people describe the experience as one of the most profound experiences of their lives and um, a spiritual experience as well. And what David Nutt found was that it seems to switch off the kind of top-down control, that what we call the default mode network, prefrontal cortex um, and other connections. And, and the effects are very different from something like ketamine or alcohol or you know, many other um, drugs that are abused. And of course, ketamine has beneficial 
therapeutic effects as well. Um, very interesting seems to sort of um, enable bits of the brain to communicate that are normally kept in check. The default modes network is sort of like the fat controller that sort of keeps us on, on the level, keeps us going to work and, and um, sort of kind of behaving as we should. And it, it's, it's kind of removing that control that enables the person to see the world in, in a different way, sort of through the eyes of a child a little bit, mm. um, that um, things become, um, you know, just a, a, you can sort of see past the ego, they call it ego dissolution. Okay. Um, and I, I realise I'm explaining this very badly. So I, I do suggest that you, you um, log into one of David Knapp's lectures because he explains it beautifully. Um, the other thing I should say is that drug science has done a lot of podcasts on psychedelic medicine. And the one by David Nichols, who is, has been researching psychedelics for a long time, um, an American um, pharmacologist, I think he is, incredible chap. He explains how psychedelics work really well pharmacologically. Some of the effects that I'm particularly interested in are um, neurological as well. And I, I sort of touched upon pain. And it looks like in this situation, um, a low dose may be sufficient. So probably cheaper thinking about the NHS uh, because the psychotherapy will not be required. Potentially um, more of a microdosing um, paradigm. Um, so things like cluster headaches. So they call cluster headaches suicide headaches because they are so severe and relentless. And I was at an event with a woman who um, is in charge of one of the charities for cluster headaches. And I don't think there's, you know, the treatment will be, as for chronic pain, will be opiates. And we know that people can't function on opiates and we know that they are addictive properties and, and so on, can be very very debilitating um, to be on, on this medicine. Um, and she showed a brain scan of a chap who had shot himself through the right eye with a shotgun. Um, it survived and actually survived quite well. But you can you, that sort of gives you an idea of how severe these headaches are. And psilocybin has been shown to have some beneficial effects for these headaches. Actually, one of the veterans I was talking to who'd used ayahuasca ayahuasca which is um, DMT which is the, the vine you know the, um, the sort of brew used by indigenous populations has been used for thousands of years um, in ceremonial settings so he said that he had terrible headaches and they have more or less gone since he's he had his ayahuasca experience I found that very interesting so again something that there's very very little medicine currently available to treat it and the other um, very interesting effect is um, inflammation. So psychedelics through the 2A receptor, which is, is found on immune cells, seems to have a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect that's not really been explored very much. So that I think that's something that we will see more of, um, especially if they reschedule and, and help us to do the research. So the other thing that people would be asking is, are these um, addictive? You know, they're illegal, they're class A drugs, surely they have to be addictive. Well, as I told you about tobacco and alcohol, they're anti-addictive, if anything. And um, somebody who's part of drug science is Professor Adam Winstock, and he runs the Global Drug Survey, where he asks users, um, you know, um, the general population, about their drug use and their drug habits. And he found that psychedelics are used infrequently by people mm. for adult use um, two or three, four times a year. So they're clearly not addictive and they're not even habit forming. Mm. So that, that's kind of interesting evidence, I think. I've never met anybody who's, who's um, used them a lot, um, really. Or, uh, so I think really they would be, I would say that they are anti-addictive. Okay. All right, thank you. It's really, really fascinating to hear about this. 
So um, before we break up, uh, I just want, wanted to ask, um, so obviously there will be a lot of stigma around using these psychedelics as medicine. So how do you think we can overcome the stigma amongst lawmakers, maybe patients, relatives or authorities who might be, you know, related to the use of these drugs? You know, Aisha, that's a really good question. And it's something that drug science have um, identified as one of our key aims. So we're going to write a paper to debunk the myths about psychedelics. Mm. I mean, I think the, the media actually has a lot of blame to take about this. Some very lazy reporting. Um, you know, so I think it's probably down to all of us mm. um, to listen, to read more, to, to become more educated. I really, as somebody who's not young anymore i really enjoyed the michael pollan book uh, and i could highly recommend that to to your listeners so he he's about 60 and he has some cardiovascular issues i think so and that is a potential risk with with psychedelics um and he uh but he decides he's going to do psychedelics and he's going to do psilocybin dmt um and i think maybe he does mescaline as well fantastic uh, um description so and, and he's a he's a food writer, isn't he? He's a mainstream chap. So I think more and more of those um, accounts will really help to reduce stigma. I think the the kind of event that we are running tomorrow, where we'll be hearing from survivors of sexual abuse, um, I think hearing from the combat veterans, hearing how 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 much healing potential and how these drugs have healed people, watching the magic medicine film. Um, at something else at Drug Science, we're hoping to make a book of um, personal accounts. I think it's listening to the personal accounts. And actually, once people realised that I was um, you know, focusing on this, lots of people have told me about their personal experiences. So I think it's it's we need to reduce the fear so so government rescheduling making it legal as a medicine um would certainly help this now there are some some countries um where they as i said in the netherlands psilocybin is legal in switzerland i spoke to a chap who has the right to prescribe lsd so that's for compassionate use canada has just enabled four patients uh, with a terminal diagnosis to access psilocybin. There are four um, cities in the States where mushrooms have been, or psychedelics, sorry, uh, mostly psilocybin, I think, have been decriminalized. Of course, that's very different from legalization, but Oregon, Oregon votes next month on whether they're going to legalize um, psychedelics for medical use. So the, the evidence is gathering uh, from the amazing work that, that they're doing at Bristol, on alcoholism, on depression. They're starting an anorexia trial at Imperial, this work with veterans. So that really the evidence is, is gathering that these drugs do have medical benefits, so, so the rescheduling should be straightforward. Um, I think there's many ways, social media, people being not frightened to share their, their experiences. Happily, I, I think that is happening, that people are more happy um, to share, you know, the beneficial effects. We all have to work towards the debunking the myths, I think. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Well, thank you very much. This was very fascinating and interesting. I learned a lot as well. So we're just going to give a 10 minute break now and resume back at 25 past, if that's OK with you. And I just would like to uh, encourage. So um, we have got loads of questions, by the way. You can tell everyone is very fascinated with this. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Oh, that's so nice. Yes. Oh, nice. Lovely. Okay, so I'm hoping that everyone can hear us because I can't see anything that says that they can't. Um, okay. All right. Okay. So, 
I'm going to start uh, with the first question. Sorry, I'm going through this on my phone so that I don't interrupt anything on my computer, just in case. Oh, nightmare. <laughs> I know, you're right. So one of the audience is asking, so um, they're mentioning that um, you just mentioned in your talk that um, majority of the people are needing one or two doses with the magic mushrooms, and they would like to find out why there is a need to have multiple infusions for things like um, ketamine and their question is apparently based on the evidence on the literature. No, that's that's a sterling question actually about ketamine. It does seem, well I mean of course ketamine is a very different molecule. Mm -hmm. You know we have actually talked about whether it's a psychedelic or not and you know it's a, it's a glutamate blocker so uh, uh, interestingly so psychedelic will in, uh, interact with the 5-HT2A receptor and it does increase the release of glutamate, as does um, ketamine. But the ke effects of ketamine, you know, they don't do any of the reconfiguration, the neurogenesis. Actually, that's something I forgot to mention, that psychedelics, I was reading a paper today, Nature paper. Uh, of course, animal studies so far, but induced neurogenesis, so, so you know you're producing new connections, new potentially new neurons. Um, it, it just seems that it's the default mode network that that, that sort of switching off and the enabling of other um, brain regions. It's it seems to be the the serotonergic, the two A. You know, and, and you know. Big disclosure, I'm completely not an expert here, but ketamine very focused on the glutamatergic system um, and those effects do not, just do not last so long. So it doesn't produce the same effect on the default mode network, on the circuitry um, or any of the re reconfiguration. There's something, as I kind of said, extraordinary about the way in which psychedelics work. And to be honest, because, as I said, the research was stopped by the Nixon administration, mm -hmm. the war on drugs. It's been very, very difficult to do this research. And people who should be doing this aren't, you know, just because of the laws. I mean, the big maps program in the US, and Johns Hopkins, they, you know, 30 million yeah. to do this work. There's a lot of companies. Um, Compass Pathways just went on the stock market last week. So it, it's happening, um, but it has been very slow and while we were doing a lot of research in you know the 80s I said in my PhD on, on 5-HT um, the serotonin system it's very nice to come back there <laughs> um, the research that we should have been doing in the 90s 80s we just couldn't so I, you know I, I there is a lot that we need to learn um, but the other thing about these are plant medicines and indigenous populations have been using them for thousands of years. Certainly ayahuasca, there's evidence that that's been used for, for a long, long time. So kind of, um, and I, I think that's got to be something we take into the therapy with us so that we're very mindful of and respectful of where these medicines came from. Um, and ketamine is, is um, uh, an anesthetic agent, isn't it? You used in animals and in small children. So it, it is a very, very different type of medicine. And I mean, it's extraordinary with psychedelics. I can't think of another medicine where you would take a couple of doses with, a, a, you know, with all the therapy and the preparation, but that you would potentially not need to have it again. That's extraordinary as well, isn't it? Absolutely yeah. extraordinary. And, and the combat veteran said that the because the experience is so profound, um, he has a, a sort of a clear memory of the experience, and that sort of is a really good place for him to be. Of course, that sort of altered. There's a fabulous podcast with a philosopher, um, the most recent one, Peter Hughes, a chap from Exeter. Uh, <laughs> very, very clever chat. That's a lovely conversation between him and David now. There's a conference coming up about the philosophy of psychedelics uh, in April at Exeter Uni next year. Um, and he said when it went online, you know, it was supposed to be this year, it sold out immediately. Mm. 
you know, that sort of altered state of consciousness um, is, is something very special about these plant medicines. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is about, you know, I was asking about, you know, the prejudices and the stigma that we need to overcome. So an audience is also mentioning that they would be interested to hear more about how to deal with the prejudices. And I would like to actually, especially the pre prejudice that you have within healthcare professionals and researchers. And I actually would like to follow this question by asking, are there any programs where you reach out to particular um, occupations to actually educate them about these, um, either yourself or anyone that you know of within the UK or within, um, in general, within Europe? So Mind Med in Germany have a whole programme of education and modules on um, psychedelic medicine and on, on medical cannabis. Uh, drug science ha with Small Pharma, one of our... Um, partners, industry partners from the Medical Psychedelics Working Group, we have prepared um, slide decks. So for, for your listeners, these are all available from the Drug Science website, drugscience.org.uk, because one of our aims is education. Medical cannabis, uh, psilocybin, DMT, I think they're, they're preparing, MDMA. So those slides are all available um, for anybody to use. So our aim is for all healthcare professionals, so for us, Aisha, for pharmacists, mm -hmm. medics, um, nurses, I mean, general public as well, but, but for the healthcare professions in particular, that's our job, isn't it? I ran a session on medical cannabis with the fourth-year pharmacy students this year. Okay. It's been a long year, hasn't it? In March, just before lockdown. And we ran two workshops, so one on uh, childhood epilepsy uh, with a paediatric pharmacist and one on neuropathic pain. And the best thing about this was we had a patient representative from the United Patients Alliance who has Ellen Danos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. She should have been in a wheelchair and fed with a chew, feeding chew. She came on the train with a stick because of her medical cannabis. And not on, not on prescription, I should say. This is this is cannabis that she secured or sourced herself. I think she just got a prescription when I saw her. So it, it's those that kind of that was a day of medical cannabis education, and all the pharmacy students said that that was one of the best things that they had done. And primarily, not because I withered on for an hour and a half about it. I think because of the the, the patient who came in. Yeah. So. Mind Med in Germany have got the modules, so so that those are able um, available. I don't know if they charge or not. <clears throat> Super organisation and um, the drug science slide decks. Like, those are a good place to. And uh, so David Nutt says when he talks to medics about medical psychedelics, the young people are very keen. The old people are very keen. It's the guys in the middle that sort of. <laughs> middle age are, are much more skeptical which i think is quite interesting because of course all the older people you know were there in the 70s 60s and saw all the beneficial effects it's the people that were sort of and the young people of course have, have more knowledge as well so it's that sort of middle group which i think is interesting yeah. but many ways and and you know if anybody um listening uh, wants to know more you can contact me contact drug science about the educate about anything just okay. email me okay great so if we can get the links for it so we can make sure that we put it on our website for anyone to actually follow it up together yes, I'll, with... I'll send you those Aisha. yeah yeah that would be great so I would like to follow on that one though um, this is a question from my husband um, who actually <laughs> came around and asked me to ask you um, <laughs> So he was wondering, you know, you mentioned, this is just a follow-up question as to what you were mentioning. So you just mentioned that, you know, it's the people in the middle who do not want to use it. It's the young people who are willing to use it and old people. And you also, in your talk, mentioned that there is more people who are actually warming up to the idea or who are actually willing to use this type of thing, psychedelic drugs, for treatment purposes. So what do you think is actually changing? Are we changing as a society? Are we changing in our perspectives? Or are we just getting more educated? What, what's happening, do you think? So, 
to be honest, I don't know that opinions are changing um, because I worry I live in an echo chamber. So I'm working on this now. I'm talking to combat veterans. I'm talking to people who've been healed. So that's sort of one. I was talking to a chap last week about that. That's sort of one element of all this. Um, so, well, I think the, the media are much more sympathetic. So when we launched the psilocybin report on rescheduling it was in every national newspaper so the sun the daily mail who are not known you know for their investigative journalism or their um, sort of um <clears throat> well their sympathy on, on any drug related issue but they all ran a reasonably sensible piece about the need for rescheduling and the importance of psychedelics as medicine so i i do I'm very hopeful that things are shifting. I just think as more studies are being done, there's quite a lot in the press about compass, pure compass pathways. There, there are companies now working in this space, bringing in investors. So there are a lot of different uh, professions now with an interest in this in this area. We, you know, we we have to be careful that it doesn't get overblown. I think. Um, and, uh, you know, let's be very clear, there are lots of people who do respond very well to current medication and, uh, you know, will not need psychedelic therapy. What I'm talking about are the, the non-responders, the people who, who don't. And, uh, for disorders like anorexia or PTSD, where there really is very little that the psychiatrist has to offer. Mm. Of course, there are other um, um, modes of, of treatment like meditation and hypnosis and another good podcast, um, the one just before Peter Hughes, very interesting on that. And of course, the, those um, therapy, talking therapy worked very well for many people. And of course, it's integrated into the psych psycho, uh, psychedelic experience. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so um, the next question is from one of our students in pharmacy though, and one of the volunteers. So um, they're asking, is there any research into developing derivatives or analogues of drugs like cyclovalin or uh, masculine at all? Yes, there's a lot of work going on there now. Yeah, there's a very nice paper on uh, the anti-inflammatory effects. And he talks about the pharmaco form and how you know, psilocybin may not be the molecule to do that. So there are lots of, um, well, some companies working in this space um, which is very exciting because of course uh, not all the molecules are the same mm. and there are aspects particularly I think maybe for the neurological aspects that there will be um, aspects or elements of the molecule and, mm. and different um, you know different affinities for, for different um, receptor types We'll, we'll, I mean, we, we need to do that research, but there's certainly an interest in that, which is, is a really good thing. Okay, that's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in your talk as well, you talked about psychedelic assisted therapy. So do you know um, about the training these therapists receive at all? Mm -hmm. Are there anything in line? Yeah. That's a really good question. I do get asked that quite a lot. Kings, I think, are running a course. They have um, so if you go on the Kings University website, they have the trip um, network, and that's a network of, of psychotherapists. Actually, somebody emailed me the other day. So there are courses coming online for that. I think that's the one that I know a little bit about is the trip network. Um, people like James Rucker at Kings University. So there and and. I know there are many people who are interested in a career in this, um, and quite a lot of the students, actually, who, who've approached me about this. So I think the first place to start is with King's College London, and to look at the TRIP network, I think they are starting to train people. My understanding is that they, they will be training um, uh, for people on retreats as well, to go and accompany uh, you know, patients on these retreats. Of course, the other person that I should have mentioned first, and shame on me, is Sarah Tai, who is at Manchester, clinical psychologist. She is very experienced psychotherapist, and she has in fact trained people on the Compass 
trial. So she's been right, training people in Bristol, London, Newcastle, um, and she is at Manchester, everybody. So she is definitely somebody to talk to if you're interested in, in training um, to be a psychedelic assistant therapist. And she's here, she's on her doorstep, and fabulous. Great, thank you. So if it's okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. We have got um, a few more, if that's okay. That's fine, yeah. yeah. So um, you made a comment about double-blinded randomized, uh, double blind randomized trials in your when we were discussing. So And you mentioned that they may not be appropriate. Um, they may not be fit for the purpose. So... Um, so they are designed to protect patients from those with vested interests and harm. Isn't that a risk here? What do you What do you think? So uh, it's. I mean, I'm not a clinician. It's a very good point. I think my point was that we have such a lot of good evidence emerging. It's a hard trial to blind. I, d I don't know because if you have a psychedelic on board, it's a high dose. You know all about it. Uh, I think it probably would be unethical to blind the clinicians. The psychotherapist, the therapist with you needs to know. Um, of, I, so at Imperial, they've just completed a comparison with escitalopram. Those are the kinds of studies that are very, very smart. So is it any better than, than conventional? But the actual complete double blinding, I'm not sure it, in this context that it will work very well. And I'm not sure it's served brilliantly for psychiatry for bringing new medicines you know by the time we get to the large phase three trials um we we seem to have had some spectacular failures in phase three the other um, sort of the other side of this is the animal work as well you know animals the animals that we would work on mice and rats do not have a particularly thick cerebral cortex or as complex network so I, i'm just for for efficacy studies i'm not sure for Mechanistic studies, certainly for for um, you know the anti-inflammatory effects, pain effects. How do how do these medicines work? I think that is useful. The RCT, though, to go back to that, that is a a, a bit of a tricky one. Um, you're right about keeping people safe and not having the bias. I just I'm not clear how you can absolutely double blind these trials. And whether whether it's it's the right sort of approach. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks very much um, for your answer on that, though. Um, do you have any thoughts on how psychedelics or psychedelic assisted therapy would be delivered under the NHS if it was taken out of Schedule One? I mean, that's a really good good question. What we're asking for, just to be clear about the scheduling, is to take it out for research. Um, and when there's enough evidence for it to become a medicine and, and FDA approve it. FDA have given breakthrough status to psilocybin for treatment of resistant depression because the need is so great and, mm. and the, um, the initial evidence is, is so impressive. Um, so it is quite difficult to imagine exactly how it would work. I guess you would have specialist clinics um, running on the NHS, like we have the trials running. Um, of course, they're funded by MRC and so on. And you would have the clinicians and the and therapists funded, you know, their NHS paid, and people would not then have to have to pay, which is the case at the moment. Actually, the case at the moment, nobody can access this outside of a clinical trial okay. um, legally. So, so that's a pretty terrible situation. But, uh, you know, I envisage um, people, you know, like really like they've done the trials, coming in for a lot of making sure there's all the preparation, then coming into the clinic for a day. I mean, with psilocybin, as I said, it doesn't last very long, so there's probably no need to stay overnight. And then coming back, you know, a week later for the higher dose, and then coming back for just really the way they've done the trials. But, you know, we sort of talked about, well, they've had two therapists for each trial. That's going to be very expensive. Maybe you, you reduce it down to one therapist. Maybe you could do group therapy. Of course, that's, that's the model for a retreat setting. 
that's quite appealing and I think some people will probably prefer that to be with other people having the same experience that would reduce the cost so mm -hmm. I think there's many ways this this can work very very well in, in clinical practice okay so do you think though in order to establish these things in an HS we're actually going to need new professionals you know new professions do you think the currently available structure is available. Can we just retrain the stuff, or do we need to actually create new occupations, new healthcare professionals to help with this? I don't think we need new professions because mm. psychiatry um, and psychotherapy. So I think you have actually you you might um, retrain some people. I, I think so. It's a very good opportunity for people. I do meet people along the way that I think would be very well suited to be a psychotherapist um, for this sort of experience that perhaps would never have considered that kind of career. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for people who would maybe not have gone down the traditional route to retrain. Yeah. Um, and then for, for existing psychotherapists, like, just like Sarah Tai is training existing therapists um, for the, the psychedelic uh, experience to, to guide people through that and then I think there's there's many people who will, will be good as guides um, and maybe you have, do have two people one person who's more junior and that's a way to, to learn okay all right thank you and last three questions <laughs> so um, in the future though do you think the psychedelics will be used more widely to manage uh, less severe forms of depression and how long do you think it might take for these medicines to be available on prescription? So that's a very, how long will it take? I mean, cannabis was legalised 2018, end of 2018. And only now our project 2020, well, 2021 um, is just, at, um, first patient got their prescription, I think about a month ago. Uh, and that really, that um, initiative was set up because people weren't getting their prescriptions. But what I hope is that we will learn from that experience, Aisha, that um, you know, we were not ready for medical cannabis. It came and uh, you know, the, the NHS was not equipped, but I would like to think that we will be much better equipped when psychedelics do become you know, legalized as medicines, that we will have learned the, the lessons from um, what happened with cannabis that really nobody was able to get a prescription. But we will need to set up specialist clinics. Of course, there are um, there are centres where these trials are going on, you know, Bristol, Newcastle, Manchester, we had a trial running. So there will be the, the kind of setup that we need already um, established. I think one of the issues with ketamine in the US has been all the private clinics mm. because we don't really have such a big private industry for medicine in this country. Mm. That, is, that could be an issue, of course, as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, is there research, though, to suggest a link between use of psych psychedelics and psychosis? Or the Aha! Word... Brilliant question. Mm. Sorry. Or the vulnerability to developing psychosis following their use? Yeah, no, that's a very, very good question. Clearly, there are people who should not, who are not going to be suited for psychedelic therapy. Mm. And the um, in all the trials and the certainly the retreats for the veterans, the heroic hearts people, there's an awful lot of care taken to um, ensure that people are safe. Um, and are suitable so they do not and, and psychosis any underlying risk for psychosis was certainly one of the risk factors where where um, um, you know it would not be considered appropriate for that person also some issues you know cardiovascular issues as well um, but we don't really understand that particularly yet um, of course people have bad trips and, and we don't really know whether they would have that would have they were predisposed or, or what happened because you know, we haven't been allowed to do the research so the rescheduling will certainly help that uh, but for sure yes this is not a therapy that certainly not to be taken lightly and not 
there are certain um, risk factors and, and for, for that will mean that certain people should definitely not um, are, are just not suitable for this kind of therapy and will be suitable for, for alternative therapies hopefully. Okay, so uh, I was wondering though, how are you going to, you know, if this becomes, you know, easier to use or if it becomes available, if it becomes available in NHS, how do you think we can stratify the patients as the ones who should use it and the ones who shouldn't? I mean, the way we're doing now, okay. so but very careful questioning um, okay. patient notes and, and records, uh, just like you would for any medication, okay. you know, psychiatrists will take very careful attention um, to any risk factors, any other, you know, underlying um, conditions, drug, drug interactions, all those kinds of things. But yeah. it will be slightly easier because people will not be on these drugs for very long. Yeah. And, you know, and we know that they are, are pretty safe, actually. Okay. Um, but of course, the, the usual care, of it, well, has to be taken as for any medicine. Okay. All right. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for your time. We only have another request where the um, uh, it's being asked if you could please share the link to the trip network at KCL. Uh, I'll see if I can find that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, you could, so I'll find that and the slides. Yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming um, we have got the email address for this person, or we will find a way to make sure that we can actually get it to them in some shape or form. Well. Lovely. Thank you very much. We kept you busy for a while. <laughs> well, yeah, as you can tell, you know, I'm delighted to talk about this. But just a couple of points. I'm not a clinician. So many of those, um, you know, the clinical questions, I, I really, I don't have the right answers for you, I don't think, because I'm just not qualified. So I, um, I would encourage you to access any talks that David Nutt is giving. And he does give a lot. <clears throat> or any of the other experts, James Rucker, Robin Carhart-Harris, actually, and, and do come to our Speak Drugs discussions on the 30th of October, that's at 12 o'clock, because Simon Ruffle is a psychiatrist and Rose Watts is a psychotherapist, so really the, the pair of them between them should be able to answer these questions a lot better, with a lot better knowledge than I have. Uh, you know, about how this will work on the NHS, how the clinics will be set up, how to ensure safety, because mm. that's something that they do routinely. Okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we will ask Jess to actually get in contact with you and um, hopefully get this link sorted out for us so we can share it with our audience. Yeah. And it has been an absolute pleasure. It was a very fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. It was very good of you to to stay so long. <laughs> I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. <laughs>